Good to see you, Stu. Yes. Good to see each of you today. You didn't float away. Our garden certainly got a lot of water. We are meant to walk in unending, unbroken, satisfying fellowship with God. We call to mind David's words that many can quote, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, I shall lack nothing. We know the words of the shepherdly care, the shepherd to his sheep. Even as David, as a young shepherd boy, must have had a heart for his sheep, taking care of them, providing for them in the field, protecting them from the wolf, from the bear, from the lion. He understood shepherds intimately because he were one. And he understood what it meant to walk closely with God, to be guided by God, to be protected by God, to be provided by God, to experience the presence of God in a deep way. We are designed to walk with God, to experience this close, intimate, unending connection with Him. Our experience of God, we get a glimpse of what it just might be in the scenes of what it will be like in the kingdom of heaven where we will worship Him, we will see Him in His glory face to face. And every tear will be wiped from our eyes, and we will see him as he is, and we will walk not by faith, but by sight. And in that day when things will be restored, and everything painful, and all blindness, and all lameness, and all deafness, and all strife, and all pain, and all parting will be wiped away, we will see him as he is, and the, the heaven and the earth will be remade, and all that is fallen and all that was broken as a result of the fall will be renewed and remade. And all we will say is hallelujah. And we will bow before God with praise and glory and adoration. Oh, what a day that will be. That's what we are meant to live in. There's just one problem. We live in a broken world. We may say there's no tears in heaven, but there sure are tears on this earth. There is brokenness on this earth. There is pain on this earth. There is parting on this earth. There is every form of sorrow on this earth. So whereas in Psalm 23, David speaks with a peaceful confidence that he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. In Psalm 51, he says, Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore <coughs> unto me the joy of my salvation. He wouldn't have to be restored in the joy of his salvation if his joy had left him. It, he wouldn't have to be restored if he didn't have the experience of the joy of his salvation leaving us. And indeed, in Psalm 51, we learn that the occasion for that 
This Psalm of David, it says, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. This incident, this sin, this failure, led to a great sense of unrest, a great sense of brokenness, a great sense of an interruption in his fellowship with God. And so this psalm begins with a prayer, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And then later on, the verses that Brother Blagg read, where David asks God, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. I want to look at three ways that God restores our souls. When we say, he restores my soul, what does God do in that soul restoration process? God is in the soul restoration business. Let us look at how our glorious God restores our souls. First way, God protects. God protects. When you see an accident on the road, first responders come to that accident, and then they will start blocking that accident. They will set up a perimeter around it. If it's serious enough, they'll close the road down. They will interrupt traffic. They will stop the threat insofar as possible. So you'll see the fire trucks blocking the, the collision. You'll see the police putting up barricades. You must protect a very difficult crisis situation. When you cut your finger, what do you want? I need a Band-Aid. You need to stop the bleeding. You might want to add some ointment to that. We need protection until that wound can heal. <clears throat> God restores our soul by protecting us. Certainly God protects us with his rod and his staff. One of the ways that God protects us, he protects us from evil in the first place. He keeps us from getting into situations that can harm us. God had been faithful in protecting David. Through a good portion of his life, he had, he had protected David as a young shepherd boy from the, from the lion, from the bear, from other wild animals. He gave David victory over Goliath. He gave David protection from Saul, who wanted to kill him after David started ascending and after God took the spirit away from Saul. And then God provided protection from the various Canaanite nations whom God had called David to drive out. He had given David a special measure of protection and had given him great victories. We see in 2 Samuel chapter 10 all of the tremendous victories that God had given David. Now the battles were still raging, but we find David in 2 Samuel 11 off the battlefield. You would think he would be safe now. He's off the battlefield. Well, it was exactly when he was off the battlefield that he let his guard down. And could it be that when he was off the battlefield, he started getting a bit bored? He wasn't doing what he was built to do. Yeah, he was a shepherd boy, but we also learned that he was quite a warrior. And warriors are meant to fight. And he was not on the battlefield, so where he was at home. He was walking outside one day, and he saw this beautiful woman. 
And for that moment, he took his eyes off of God and he put his eyes on an illicit relationship. And as we preached a couple of weeks ago, things went from bad to worse, and he hid his sin. He tried to cover it up and ended up killing somebody to cover it up. Uriah the Hittite, who was living honorably. David ought to have treated his men and been on the battlefield, even as Uriah refused to go home to be with Bathsheba. He said, how can I go home and all of my comrades in arms are still on the battlefield? Well, David went home. David was not on the battlefield, and he ended up dishonoring God and sinning greatly. God reminds us that we are in war, we are in a battle, that we are to take up the armor of God, that we are to, on a daily basis, pro stand strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We all know the armor of God stands firm with the belt of truth around our waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. He protects us. And even as Jesus responded to the temptations of the evil one, we read um, that when the evil one tempted Jesus, after every temptation, Jesus responded with Scripture. For all of the lies and deceptions that the devil threw at Jesus, the Lord spoke the word of God. And so we are called to have the protection of the armor of God uh, to keep us from the vulnerabilities that happen in our world. So protection is an important aspect of preserving our souls, but also restoring our souls. If something has happened that has harmed us or harmed others, we need to make sure that we stop the bleeding, that we protect from any further harm. So that is one way that God restores our souls through protection. Number two, sometimes protection can only do so much. Sometimes God takes a different approach. Now, you've heard that sometimes God sends prophets to comfort the afflicted and then to afflict the comfortable. God would send prophets to speak words of judgment against the nations who were oppressing others, who were turning from God to idols. And so, number two, God at times provokes. And as we saw here in Psalm 51, in the inscription on Psalm 51, God sent the prophet Nathan to David. Now, provocation often has a, a negative connotation. Uh, you incite someone to anger. Now, pr provocation, uh, it, if you look up the definition, it'll say something like to incite or to call forth. A teacher can provoke hard work in their student. Uh, in the case of David, we read in 2 Samuel chapter 12 how God used Nathan in this situation. Let me read from the first part of 2 Samuel chapter 12. It says, The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. 
It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over, because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if all of this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite, with the sword and took his wife as your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. I've learned through some of the reading that I've done this week that they've actually named some defense mechanisms after the, after King David. They, they talk about the, the, the David response, where they describe David's activity in burning with anger at the story that Nathan told. And we hear of the term projection, where we ascribe to somebody else the very evil, the very thing that is within our own heart. We project it outside to someone else. Nathan understood that coming directly to David and confronting him with his sin in a direct way was unlikely to happen. Nathan skillfully told this story and got behind David's defenses and at just the right time, he named that David was the man who was the subject of this, of this story. What's interesting about how God provokes us, how sometimes we are confronted with our sin, an interesting word origin for the book Confront, the word origin initially said, with face. The root word con was, in, at the beginning, was calm. Now we think of community. Community, living with, abiding with, common. And then front, with face. So, in essence, the idea of confronting someone is to face something with someone else. <clears throat> of course, now we look at this idea of confrontation, of being against someone. What a difference it makes when we face things with other people. We help one another. We spur one another on to love and good deeds. We are not against one another. We are for one another. And indeed, the same thing with God. Those glorious words that if God is for us, who can stand against us? Sometimes God does have to confront us. Sometimes God does have to provoke us. When we get hard, when we forget the Lord, what does the Lord do in the Old Testament? Well, it, it talks about how 
the people of God walk with him at times, but then they start drifting away from him, forget him, and then what does he do? He raises up some enemy to come up against his people. And then suddenly the people realize their crisis, they call out to God, they confess their sins, and then God raises up rulers or judges who will bring peace and restore a sense of restoration in his people. But then a restored people will then become complacent once again, and then God has to bring another enemy against them, and the cycle continues. Ideally, you would never drift away. Ideally, you would always maintain a strong relationship. But sometimes the Lord brings adversity or difficulty into our lives. It is in pain, it is in trial, that we are tested and sometimes disciplined. And discipline is not pleasant in the moment. We do not enjoy it, but it eventually harvests a fruit of righteousness and improved character. So sometimes God passes us through the, the fire in order to change us, in order to restore our souls. Sometimes we have to experience the heat before we will change. While it seems counterintuitive that God would have to provoke us sometimes in order to restore our souls, indeed, he does that. So God protects, God provokes, but he also restores our souls by providing for us. He provides for us. He gives us what we need. The Lord will provide. When you think of that, our thoughts may go back to the story of when Abraham was called to sacrifice his son Isaac. Abraham didn't know what God was up doing, but Abraham believed God. It was credited to him as righteousness, and he got to the point where he was about ready to sacrifice his own son. But then God provided Abraham. The sacrifice that was given in place of Abraham's son, Isaac. So indeed, in restoring our souls, God provided the sacrifice of his own son to cover our sin. Not only did he provide a holy sacrifice, but he also provided a holy spirit a Holy Spirit to dwell within us, to counsel us, to guide us, to comfort us, to create the fruit of the Spirit, which is a character likened after our Lord. We saw that God took his Spirit from Saul. Saul's soul was hardened after God. But God gave his Spirit to David. David had seen what happens when God removes his spirit from Saul, and imagine the kind of pain David must have realized when he thought, is the Lord going to take his spirit away from me too? And so we see in Psalm 51, he says, take not your spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation, and renew a right spirit within me. Thanks be to God that he gives us the Holy Spirit to guide us and counsel us and cr to create godly character within us. But then he also provides for us a holy people. He puts us into a church, into a body, where we can spur one another on to love and good deeds. We can encourage, sometimes correct, sometimes rebuke. Sometimes to instruct with great patience and careful instruction. We have words in the New Testament where it says, Bear with one another. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. That is what we are designed to do. We are designed to be part of the restoration 
of one another's souls. We each, every one of us, falls into patterns that are not good for us. We'll just say it as we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. We do things we know we ought not to do, and we fail to do things that we know we ought to do. We fall short of God's glory. And if we haven't put up all kinds of defenses and denials, it will cause us pain. It'll cause us guilt. It'll cause us shame. It'll want us to drift away from God. It'll want us to hide from one another. If, if anybody knew what was going on in my life, they would completely reject me. But the idea of the body of Christ is that we need to, be, we need to face things with each other. Not against each other. We do not need to be against each other. We need to be for each other. The problem is, is the evil one wants to do what he can to divide us and to tear us apart and to kill us and destroy us. God came that we might have life and have it to the full. God came to fight for our souls. God came to cleanse us, to cure us from our soul's diseases. We need to contend for one another. We need to fight for one another. We need to protect and provide for one another. And thanks be to God for that. There are plenty of things that will destroy us from the inside out or from the outside in if we are not careful. We have to stand strong. And I think sometimes we can forget that we are at war and we fail to put on the armor of God. And we fail to protect one another. Forgive me. I, I know I'm getting a bit wild, riled up here. But, Go ahead. but, yeah. but we, yeah, so we are at war, okay? <laughs> and there are forces in our congregation that could tear it apart, or, sorry, I think that, or it could make us stronger. Yep. We could, if we stood together, and we realize that, look, okay, the evil one doesn't want a thriving congregation here in Albany. He just wants to destroy, he wants to pick off, or he can rally us and make us stronger. And, and when we come to each other, we can speak the truth in love. And, and, and we gain confidence in one another and say, Brother Davies, I messed up. Brother Davies, I am not living up to my potential. I keep doing things that I ought not to do. Brother Davies will speak the truth in love to me. And he, if, if he disagrees with something I'm saying, he'll say, well, I don't know if I see the same thing on that. But there, there are members in this congregation, and I thank God for each of you, who have borne with me, who encourage me, who say, okay, Eric, you did pretty well on that. <coughs> If there is something that is not right in me, you know, make sure you deal with that. And, and so, yes, please come to me when I am caught in a sin, if I'm teaching something wrong, if I have a mis, mis under, if, if, if I'm doing something that is unhealthy, please confront me. Please come to me. And I pray that as time goes on, that we can know each other. We can grow together to the point where we have trust in one another. All right, I think I've, I've said the essence of where we're doing, and time is about there. So thank you for receiving this word today. So, he restores our souls. He leads us in his paths. He protects us. He provokes us. He provides for us. May God protect, provoke us, and provide for us here that we may be restored. Let's pray. Father, we do cry out to you. We do pray that you will protect us from the evil one. We know that there are many forces of good that have emerged within us. And you've done so many good things, and often we praise your name, even as David praised you, and we thank you for the glorious presence we feel with you as well, but there are times when the words of David in Psalm 51 are more characteristic of our experience, and so we do cry out to you that you will create new hearts within us and renew a steadfast spirit within us. If we are caught in a sin, if we are overtaken in faults, 
May we not hide it from you, may we not hide it from others, but may we have a broken and contrite spirit, even as David had a broken and contrite spirit, and your forgiveness <coughs> flowed to him. So may we experience the same kind of restoration in our own lives. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. I typically have a standard invitation. You want prayer? Let's pray for each other. You need baptism? Please be washed and rise to walk in newness of life. I know we all have needs. Whatever that need might be, please make it known as we stand and sing the song of invitation. I heard an old story How the Savior came from glory How he gave his life